Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the latest and the greatest of the Outspoken Podcast through the airways of OBN Radio, and as always, the second floor of the Memorial Student Center, better known as the MSC. I'm your host, Andre Davis. The call-in number, as always, 469-474-9370. Again, that's 469-474-9370. Another jam-packed show for you today, college football on the horizon, plus coming up, what in the hell happened with the NFL players this past weekend? Seriously, I want to know. Did they take an extra kickboxing class this weekend, or did they take an extra shot of testosterone? I mean, what happened? We'll get into that a little bit later. Plus, Cowboys winning against the Kansas City Chiefs by score 28 to 17. How about them Cowboys? We'll get into that as well. Plus, the Houston Texans. We'll talk about the NFC East coming up. And I have to get this off my chest. I have to. I've been prolonging it for the past two weeks. I've been ignoring it. But I have to get off the Dallas Mavericks. I have to get off my chest this week. I just have to. Starting to start the season off one and ten is just unacceptable. And coming from a Dallas and coming from a Dallas fan, Dallas Cowboys or the Dallas Mavericks, I feel like I have the credibility to do so. So I'm gonna be venting today. So just buckle up fasten your seatbelt, and get ready. We'll get into that a little bit later in the show because I have to save the best for last, and I'm going to do that. So, starting off, as always, we're going to get into some college football. Ohio State getting destroyed by Iowa by the score of 55 to 24. It really frustrates me. Inconsistent play from Ohio State this season. It really is. They lost that game in the second and the fourth quarter. Second quarter. They gave up 17 points. They gave up 21 points. Excuse me. Fourth quarter, gave up 17 points. That's a total of 38 points, and they were only able to answer back within those two quarters 14 points. And I don't care what anybody says. An Urban Meyer coach team should never lose to Iowa. Certainly not by the score of 55 to 24. I get it. I understand it. Iowa came in six. And three, I understand they actually been playing some pretty good football up to this point. More than which me and along with other people, I'm other people I'm sure haven't really expected them to play. I get all that. I understand it. But in terms of matching up to a team like Ohio State, a team that was once ranked in the top five, down towards the top ten, a team like Ohio State and Urban Meyer coach team. There is no way they should have lost this game, and certainly not by the score of 55 to 24. I'm going to get on JT Barrett in just a minute because he's really frustrating me. Because how you go from playing great the week before and coming back and ultimately winning against Penn State by the score of 30 to 39, and then turn around and just playing the complete opposite against Iowa State. I don't know. Maybe you left everything out on the field last week and then you didn't have anything this week because that was one heck of a comeback last week against Penn State, uh, mostly in the fourth quarter, third and fourth quarter. I get all that. But nonetheless, you still have eyes watching you. And it's all about what have you done for me lately. We can talk about the past all we want to, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. And what it boils down to is what have you done for me lately. And I was furious with what I saw this past weekend. From, Iowa, from Ohio State. And I'm going to get more off into that in, in, uh, here in just a moment in comparison to a team that I feel like should be in this place and moving up. And I'll get into that here in just a second. And as far as that is concerned, another game that really stood out to me, the shootout between Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. I'm going to be honest. I had Oklahoma State win this game. I really did. And I received quite a bit of controversy about that over this entire weekend. I have. Because I'm going to say, because people come to me talking about, how can you go against uh, Baker Mayfield and just that explosive offense of Oklahoma? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I can certainly do that. I can certainly go up against it. Because I've been pulling for Oklahoma State this entire year. I got two words. Mason Rudolph. That? How? It's simple. Mason Rudolph is great. He's poised. He has the poise. He has the mobility. He certainly has the arm. He has the distance. And he has the accuracy. That offense is explosive. They were the number one ranked offense 
in terms of points coming into this game. Now, Oklahoma was number three, so you had two of the top five offenses going up against each other, which certainly that was exciting to see, which is another reason why I highlighted this as the college game of the week for me. I know you can make the argument as far as Penn State and Michigan State, and, and I'm going to get to that here in just a second, but in terms of the game that was the highlight game of the weekend for me, it was Oklahoma and Oklahoma State. Because I'm just going to keep it real, I'm just going to keep it real with you. I am an offensive guy. I always have been. I always will be. I grew up and I played running back. So, therefore, I'm an offensive guy, which means I love to score, which means I love to see scoring. I love to see touchdowns. I love to see points. Baker Mayfield went off for 598 yards and five touchdowns. That's almost 600 yards, people. That's almost 600 yards. It's 598 yards and five touchdowns. What? Are you kidding me? 598 yards. That is freak of nature. It really is. I honestly, I didn't really know who had the upper hand in this game. I didn't. As I said before, I'm an offensive guy, which means big numbers in games excites me. Now, both of these teams are averaging 45 points per game this season. But in the last three games, Oklahoma was averaging 53 points per game, and Oklahoma State was averaging 38 points per game. So right away, I knew this was going to be a shootout. I knew it was. Both defenses were going to have a tough time this game. I had no doubt about that, which is another reason why I wanted to watch the game. I believe the point spread was uh, somewhere around 70 points, 72 points, or plus, 72 plus or something like that. I knew it was going to be a shootout. I really did. And in fact, it was exactly that. As I said before, didn't really know who had the upper hand in this game. I really didn't. Because on one hand, you can make the argument, yeah, Oklahoma had the upper hand, but then Oklahoma State turns around and answers with a score of their own. And that really went back and forth until it came down to who had the ball last. I believe Oklahoma had the final upper hand when they was able to score. And then Oklahoma State was not able to turn around and answer on that previous drive, and they gave the ball back to them, and Oklahoma scored again. Now Oklahoma State found themselves down by two touchdowns, and instead of always answering, which is what they were doing in the previous part of the game and tying the ball game up, they found themselves down by not only one touchdown, but two touchdowns, or at least somewhere close to that. So they had to play catch-up for, for majority of the second half. But nonetheless, it still was a very entertaining and exciting game. And unfortunately, it hurts me to say this, even though I am a Big 12 guy, but I'm a Texas Longhorns guy myself, and I can't stand the Oklahoma Sooners. I never have, and I never will. But at the same time, I give credit where credit is due, and I'm giving credit to the Oklahoma Sooners for that victory against Oklahoma State. I just have I just have to. Now, in terms of the FBS playoffs, as we are 10 minutes past the hour here on Outspoken, and again, the call in number is 469 474 9370. Andre Davis coming at you through the airways of OB and radio, and as always, the second floor of the Memorial Student Center, better known as the MSC. In terms of the FBS playoffs, teams that should be in it, from my standpoint, we already know Alabama, of course. There's no argument there. Georgia, of course, because they've been playing stellar football all season long. I still like to see Alabama and Georgia play each other. I really do. That's going to be another interesting game to me. I really like to see those two teams battle it out. Georgia is the only team that I have seen up to this point that I feel like can match up with Alabama physically. That's the the thing when it comes to Alabama. It's not necessarily point-wise, matching them point-wise, because they don't just necessarily just go a whole bunch of points per game, depending on the teams they're playing. They're playing some sorry teams that, of course, you can expect 40-plus points. But it's all about the physicality when it comes to a team like Alabama. Because for some reason, Nick Saban just it never surprises me that he's always just goes out and just gets some some corn corn fed running back that just looks like he just beats up. I mean, my goodness, he looks like, they, they always look like a man amongst boys. So it's always the physical when it comes to matching up against a team like Alabama. And so far this season, Georgia is the only team that shows me. 
that they can match up to them at some, to some degree physically that would make for a very exciting and compelling football game. So you, I have Alabama number one, Georgia number two. I'm making the argument for Notre Dame. I really am. I was slightly skeptical at the beginning of the season, and even in terms of after the couple of games, slightly skeptical. But they have proven me wrong. They've been playing excellent, excellent football all week, every week from this point on. Notre Dame. And, unfortunately, number four for me is going to be Oklahoma. It's going to be. I have to put Oklahoma. I certainly believe that Oklahoma should be in the top four. And they should be in postseason play after the regular season goal. They should be. It should not be Clemson. Clemson is number four right now. They should not be at number four. They need to switch that, and Oklahoma needs to be in front of Clemson at number four and playing in the postseason, and here's why. Yes, both teams are 8-1. I get that. Yes, both teams have lost one game. I get that. But I can make more of an argument for Oklahoma's loss than Clemson's loss. You want to know why? Because Clemson lost to Syracuse, a team that is 4-5. Now, before you condemn me, Oklahoma did lose to Iowa State. I get that. But at the same time, Iowa State is 63 right now. And Iowa State is a team that has upset multiple teams this year. They have. They have turned that organization upside down. I give credit where credit is due. I have to. I can't just look at one side without viewing the other. I just can't do it. That's not my thing. I can't do it. I have to give credit where credit is due. And Iowa State is playing excellent, excellent football this year. I mean, let's just look at the teams that they've upset this year. They've upset Oklahoma. I certainly, me and along with everybody else, definitely had Oklahoma winning that game. They upset Oklahoma. TCU, they certainly upset TCU. Nobody had TCU losing that game. Iowa State upset at them. You could possibly make the argument for Texas Tech, but honestly, I still had Texas Tech on paper. I still had Texas Tech winning that game. I really did. I didn't have them winning by far. I didn't have them winning by a long shot. It definitely wasn't going to be a blowout. I knew Iowa State was going to make it a competition. It was going to be competitive. I get that. But when the but when, when, when the last whistle was blown, when the clock was 0-0, zero, zero, I definitely had Texas Tech with more points than Iowa State, and it was a flip side around. Best three. And they almost beat West Virginia. They almost beat them. And West Virginia is a good football team this year. And they almost beat West Virginia. They made that game close and competitive. So Iowa State is playing some really, really good football. You don't become 6-3 and three without playing good football, especially against teams that you on paper were not supposed to beat. Now, Syracuse, on the other hand, haven't really been having an interesting season. But the moment they beat Clemson, that game against Clemson, I know you can make the argument that quarterback for Clemson, Kelly Bryant, got hurt, and everything just went downhill from there. But they were struggling against Syracuse before Kelly Bryant got hurt. The offensive line wasn't really protecting him at all, and he got popped really, really badly. He got drugged into the ground. But nonetheless, Clemson wasn't playing good football before he got hurt. And then him getting hurt did not help the pitch at all because they just went downhill from there. But you can make that argument as well. But at the same time, that game was Syracuse's Super Bowl. It really was. It was Syracuse's Super Bowl. They had their 15 minutes of fame that day because they have not really done anything up to this point. Yes, I said it. How else can you claim to be a 4 and 5? But somehow, even though Clemson went down, they went down from the top five, and they were dragging along in the around nine and ten. And then here we are, week ten, week eleven, and they're back in the top five, number four to be exact, behind Georgia, Alabama, and Notre Dame. I feel like the way Oklahoma has been playing, I feel like the loss against Iowa State is credible in terms of how Iowa State have been playing up to this point. In terms of how Oklahoma and Baker Mayfield have been playing up to this point, and speaking of Baker Mayfield, if there is anybody that deserves to be playing 
postseason. And again, it frustrates. I want, I want y'all. I want. I want y'all to understand this. I really want y'all to understand this, and really, I want to really make this clear. It frustrates me to say this because I can't stand. Oklahoma, and while I'm not against Baker Mayfield and the type of player and the person that he is on the field and off the field, while I'm not against that, nonetheless, he still wears that red and white every weekend. That's the team that you play for. You play for Oklahoma soon. So, unfortunately, I have to, I have a right to feel the way I feel. And it frustrates me to say this because of who the team that he plays for, but nonetheless, I still give credit where credit is due. And if there's anybody as of right now, I can also make the same argument for Saquon Barkley because I just love the guy. He's still my pick for the Heisman Trophy, even though he's not going to win it. I'm just going to be perfectly clear about that. But the way the dude has been playing all season long, even though for the past couple of weeks, teams have kind of keyed in on him and they're kind of figuring out his strengths and, and some weaknesses, and they're kind of slowing him down a little bit. You know, he's not getting past the first wave of defenders like he normally do. That's neither here nor there. But as I said before, if there's any team, any team, if there's any person, excuse me, if there's any person, that deserves to be playing in the postseason when the regular season is over is Baker Mayfield. He has 3,226 passing yards so far this season. They've got about three games left, three or four games left. He has 3,226 passing yards, 28 touchdowns, and only five interceptions. I repeat that, 3,226 passing yards, 28 touchdowns and only five interceptions. That means for every interception, he's thrown about five plus touchdowns. He's thrown about five plus touchdowns. 5.6 to be exact. For every interception. That, I can live with that. On any given day from a quarterback, I certainly can. I I have no argument there. So, honestly, honestly, he has my vote in terms of postseason play. Now, yes, I may sound controversial. Yes, I may I may sound like I'm going back on my word in terms of, oh, yeah, Andre, yeah, he has your vote uh, for postseason play, but he doesn't have your vote for the Hawks trophy. Uh, the two doesn't add up. Yeah, well, so what? Yeah, at the end of the day, Baker Mayfield, because we're talking about MVP status, and I know you can make the same argument for Baker Mayfield, but, uh, but in terms of what Saquon Barkley has been doing all season long, in terms of how much of a dual threat he is at the running back position, some of the things that everybody are saying these days that they want in a running back, well, he has it. In terms of his explosiveness, not only once he gets the ball, his ability to get past the second wave, the first and second wave of defenders, how strong he is when he runs the ball, it takes at least two plus defenders to bring him down. And then on top of that, Brother can catch out the back of like no other. You can line this brother up as a slot receiver, and it's just it's just gold. It really is. It's really just gold. There's no argument there. That, and the most other thing that I wish I could get into, but I can't right now because we have to move on because the other thing I have to get off my chest. But that is one of the main reasons why he has my vote for the Heisman Trophy. But nonetheless, he's not going to get it. He's not. I know how it works. We've been we've seen this before. There's been countless, countless times, and we've seen it before, there's too many players that have been deserving of the Heisman Trophy that didn't get it. So to me, the fact that the, the fact that Penn State, even though it's a even though it's an individual war, even though it's an individual war, it wouldn't surprise me if this will play an effect into it. Because at the end of the day, the bottom line is Penn State is not going is not going to the postseason. They're not. You can't lose to Ohio State after being down, I mean after being up more than 15 points, and coming back in losing. Then the following week, losing to Michigan State, even though something created to the uh, to the weather delay and everything like that, for a minute there, I didn't think I was going to catch the damn game because it, it was like nearly a two-hour delay. I had other stuff to do. I didn't think I was going to catch the game. Some, some can argue that point. But nonetheless, don't lose to Ohio State, who just lost, who just got destroyed by Iowa. You don't lose to Ohio State and turn around and lose to Michigan State and think that you're going to the postseason. It just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't. So unfortunately, for Saquon Barkley is concerned, he and Penn State 
will not be in postseason play. It just won't happen. It frustrates me because I really like to see this kid go beyond the regular season. I really do because he's just that talented. He really is. But it's just not going to happen. But I do make the argument for Oklahoma and because of Baker Mayfield that he and Oklahoma should be in that fourth spot and not Clemson. He should. We're 21 minutes past the hour here on Outspoken. Again, we are 21 minutes past the hour here on Outspoken. And before I wrap up college football, oh, I've been pondering on this all day long. Wasn't for sure if I was going to bring it up. I've been thinking about it all day long. I really have. I want y'all to. I want y'all to be real. I want to be real when I say this because it's the truth. It's the God honest truth. I've been pondering back and forth with this. Wonder if I was going to bring it up. Here it is. My beloved Caribbean Indian University football team took a hard loss this weekend against the Southern Jaguars by a score of 37 to 31. This is another one. I said this on 1876 uh, post game show, hashtag the after party, for those of you that know that and listen to that, me and the producer of this show, Dr. Mike Prince himself, go on 30 minutes after, after the conclusion of the Caribbean University football game, and we dissect it, we analyze it, bouncy bounce, bounce off of each other, ask questions, and really get down to the bottom line of Prairie View and Prairie View football. And the bottom line to me is this. When it comes to Southern, when it comes to them playing Southern, and I said this on the show, we can go down the list. We can go down the list from start to finish in the preseason and check off teams that we just know for sure PV football should have no problem against. Ain't really no point in us laying those, out, laying those teams out right now. If you if you know preview football, you cover preview football, you pretty much know who those teams are because they pretty much play the same teams every year with the toss-up of uh, Mississippi Valley State and uh, and some other teams like that. But for the most part, you pretty much know who those teams are. But when it comes to Southern, I've been saying this for the past two or three years now. I've only been here since 2014, but just going back to the previous years before that anyway, and people have told me the same thing, the people that are alumni from Prairie View, that when it comes to Southern, it's always that question mark. The reason why I always put Southern on that question mark is because they always schedule Southern, you know, kind of past the midway point of the season. I've never seen Southern really play, apparently play Southern at the beginning portion of the season. It's always past the, it's like right after, at, right after the midpoint of the season. And the reason why I always put Southern as a question mark, because for me, it's always based upon how well Prairie is playing up to that point. If Prairie is playing with a lot of momentum, they've been winning a lot of games. I feel we're strongly about the offense and mainly the defense, because that's what's been lacking for Prairie View for the past two or three, four years. If they're playing well, and they're playing great, it may be a guess. And I'm still saying maybe. And the reason why I say that is because it's always a shootout when it comes to Prairie View and Southern. Both of these teams have explosive offenses. Both of these teams are going to score 25-plus points. And we saw her here tonight, 30-plus to be exact, 37-31, in the eyes of Southern winning, of course. But they always score a lot of points. It's always going to be a shootout between these two teams, honestly. It was like that last year, even though it seemed like kind of Prairie View, uh, Southern kind of had the upper hand for a little bit in terms of the first and second quarter. It was always a shootout between Prairie View and Southern. Then Southern ended up winning, of course, by a score of 44 to 34. And then the year before that, same thing, kind of a shootout kind of deal, if you will. Then Prairie View ended up winning, of course, 47 to 42. See how big these numbers are? See how, see how, see how big these numbers are in terms of uh, points? I know one looked at and go, well, what the hell was the damn defense that game? Did they take a nap? Did they not show up? Was it just offense against offense? Did defense not play? That's just how it is when Prairie View plays Southern. And it was always that question mark. And as I said before, it's always dependent upon for me in terms of my decision as to whether or not Prairie View is going to win is how well are they playing up to this point in the season? Are they playing well? Are they playing poorly? How well did they play against Grammar? And I mean, now when I say that, not did they beat Grambling, but how well did they match up against Grambling? Did Grambling just go out there and just run right through them like eggs in the morning? Or did they actually put their foot down and prove that they deserve to be on the same downfield just like Grambling and not just lay down and give them the game? What did they do? 
that's always the deciding factor. And then once they turn around and play Alcorn, did they beat them? How well did they play against them? How well have they been matching up to other teams up to this point? It's my it's is is a determining factor for me as to whether or not they're gonna be stuck. And unfortunately, they didn't get it done. I'm 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 I'm, I'm it's, it was a long weekend. It was a long weekend. But unfortunately, my Dallas Cowboys were able to make it all right. And that's what they did. And that's why I love the stars. Speaking of the stars, we're gonna jump into the NFL. But before we get to the Cowboys, because I want to give them X amount of time because they deserve it from the win that they got against the Kansas City Chiefs by score twenty eight to seventeen. I want to make sure I give my boys time. But before I jump into that, I gotta give my opinion on something. Because this is something that's really been kind of fluctuating with me for quite some time now. Over the weekend, I saw various conversations on TV. I listened to it on radio. I looked at it on social media. There's been various conversations in terms of Thursday night football and what it does to players. And and, this, and there's this whole bunch of – a whole lot of controversy around Thursday night football and whether or not it should be allowed – or, or, you know, or should they just get rid of it or in terms of uh, uh, the, the bad teams that play on Thursday night football and how, yeah, how bad teams normally uh, bad teams normally play on Thursday night football. It seems that fans don't really care about. It's a waste of television programming. They shouldn't air Thursday night football. They should take it off the schedule and everything like that. I also heard, I also heard people talking about um, the turnaround, the quick turnaround that it is for players in terms of if they just played on Sunday night, they got to turn around and play again on Thursday night, or just the lack of preparation in terms of practicing. Because you, well, of course, you get a shorter week, especially if you have to fly in uh, to another, especially if you're a visiting team, then you're getting an even shorter week because you got to fly in or drive in, or however you got to do to get there. So that's like so that that takes away from practice preparation, uh, possibly um, uh, treatment uh, to the nicks and bruises or anything like that. I understand all that. But here's my deal, and I want to be very clear about this, and I, and I hope I don't step on any toes but at the same time as outspoken, and it's my job to be outspoken here on this show about something that I either feel strongly about, something that I feel strongly against. This is what I have to do. And here's my thing with Thursday night football. This past Thursday night was the New York Jets and the Buffalo Bills. Now, on one hand, you can just think of the names right there. Okay, New York Jets, Buffalo Bills, who's watching that, right? Okay, well, the New York Jets are four and five. And honestly, surprisingly, the Buffalo Bills are five and three. They were five, they were five and two uh, coming to that game against the New York Jets, but then they lost by a score of 34 to 21, and they ultimately dropped their record to five and three. But they actually, they actually haven't been playing or too bad of a football uh, up to this point. But nonetheless, there's my concern. I get it. It's a short turnaround when it comes to Thursday night football. I get that. You don't have a lot of time to practice because it's a shorter week. I get that. It can ultimately cause injury, especially if you're sore or kind of broken up a little bit from the previous Sunday. I get all that. You won't be able to have treatment. I understand all of that perfectly clear. But here's one thing that, in my opinion, I feel like, that I feel like trumps all of that. You're professional. By professional, you get paid millions and millions of dollars to do what you do. You don't have an everyday job. You don't have a nine to five like most people. This is what you do. You sign up to play football at a professional level. You get rewarded for that by signing a million dollar contract. And for the elite athletes, for the really good ones, for the ones that we turn on our TV on Sunday to see purposely, you can pay more because people tune in to see you play. So you get rewarded for that. So on one hand, it's hard for me to feel sorry for you in terms from that perspective. Not trying to dismiss the cause and effect of Thursday night football. I get it. Personally, myself, 
I wasn't an advocate for Thursday night football either because I said, okay, if you're going to subject us to watching Thursday night football, the least you can do is give us something to watch. Give us two teams that we care about. Do we really care about the New York Jets and the Buffalo Bills playing each other on Thursday night football? Do we really? Be honest. I really want to know. Do we really care? I can answer that for you. No, we don't. Not entirely. Not entirely. We really don't. So I'm just being honest. Now, coming up this Thursday, you got the Seattle Seahawks. You got the Arizona Cards. Okay. That's better. And I believe the previous weeks before that, they've been doing a little bit better in terms of the matchups and everything like that. But in terms of years and years ago, it was just bad. It was awful. The lineup was so piss poor. I think I'd rather watch cartoons. That's how bad it was. And I'm a grown man. 21 about to be 22 this year. I'd rather watch Barney than watch Thursday Night Football. That's just how bad it used to be. They're getting a little bit better. It's like they're slowly but surely are kind of getting better in terms of the lineup. That's good. Keep it that way. That's my only issue when it comes to Thursday Night Football. And I understand in terms of the players that complain, uh, complain and talking about, oh, well, you know, it's a turnaround and we don't have a, we have a shorter week. We don't have time to prepare. Uh, it's just overall bad. They shouldn't have Thursday Night Football. Man, look here. You can pay millions and millions of dollars. That is what you do. Part of your contract is planned on Sundays, planned on Mondays, and in some cases planned on Thursday. And Oh, and by the way, it ain't like you got to do it every week. I'll be a different advocate if you had to play on Sundays and you had to play on Thursdays and it was every week. Oh, and hell, every other week. For the most part, it's only one time a year. Because every team has to do it for the most part. So it's not just you. You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not, every team don't have to do it every week. Just one time. Really? You got a problem with that? For one time? That's it? No. Unacceptable. Completely unacceptable. And I can't feel sorry. I just can't. Because when somebody gets paid for their services, how can you argue? How can you argue? I understand. There may be things about it that you don't like. You know, I mean, there's things about everybody's job that they don't like, but they still have to do it. They still have to get up. You think the guy working at Waterburger right now likes flipping burgers? Well, he might, but just in, just if I had to do a poll and, and, and I had to do a survey for the people actually like what they're doing in terms of working at water and flipping water burgers and things like that, I think I know what the answer would be. But at the same time, he has to do it if he wants to get paid. He has to do it if he wants to receive his check at the end of the week. You want to receive your check at the end of the week, and this goes for whatever job, whatever occupation you have. You got to suck it up. And do what you got to do to get your money. That's just how I feel about that. That's how I feel about that. But we're going to move on to some excitement here on Outspoken. Again, we just now tuning in. I am Andre David, your host. This is another edition of the latest and the greatest of the Outspoken podcast through the airways of OBN Radio. And as always, the second floor of the Memorial Student Center, better known as the MSC. And we're talking NFL right now. We cover college football, Ohio State. Baker Mayfield, State Corn Barkley, Georgia, Notre Dame, Alabama, Oklahoma State, who should be in the top four. We discussed that preview in the Southwestern Athletic mm-hmm. Conference. We talked about all of that. We're going to jump into the NFL right now in terms of my team, that star Cowboys win against the Kansas City Chiefs by a score of 28 to 17. These guys were on fire. Do you hear me? They were on fire. Fire from start to finish. Elliot, he was great. Another 20 plus carry game. This is pretty usual when it comes to the Dallas Cowboys and the offense. I said it before and I'm going to say it again. As long as Elliot is flowing, the offense is flowing. Now, when I say that, I feel like people get kind of tripped up when people say that, because I've heard other people say it too in terms of like, Elliott is flowing, the offense is flowing. That doesn't take away from Dak Prescott. It certainly does. It really does. He had two or three touchdowns yesterday, two to uh, Cole Beasley and one on the ground. Dak can ball. And personally, 
I don't feel like Dak needs Elliott to ball. I feel like the offense and the way that the offense is structured needs Elliott. Because look at the, just look at the number that he's been getting. Per, look at the number of touches he's getting per week. You don't get 25-plus touches per game if you're not important to that offense. Whether you play wide receiver, whether you play tight end, whether you play quarter, whether you play running back, if you're getting 20-plus touches, you're important to that offense. And, yes, you will be missed if you were not to be there. And in this particular case, it's Ezekiel Elliott. If everything, if, if everything goes through with the suspension and he has to sit out for six games. Oh, by the way, his attorneys are talking with the NFL to get that reduced down, which is what I feel like they should have did in the beginning instead of appealing here, appealing here, appealing here, appealing here, thinking that they're going to win against the NFL, and it's not going to happen. I said it before and I'll say it again. He's going to serve those six games, whether now or later. It's going to happen. And I feel like his attorneys are finally starting to realize that. Now, I can go into a completely different argument in terms of why Ezekiel Elliott is doing this. Is it about football? Is it truly about is it, is it truly about clearing his name? But nonetheless, what's done is done. Now, personally, at this point, I don't feel like it's about guilt or innocence. I, I feel like it's about the power of the NFL and, NF, and, and Ezekiel Elliott and his attorneys trying to go up against that. That, in my opinion, is what it, it is about at this point. At the beginning of the season, back in August and even in September, yes, maybe at that point, it's still about guilt or innocence. Now, may, now, for Elliot, it may be about guilt or innocence because he's the victim in this particular case. But in terms of what's been going on between Elliot, his attorneys, and the NFL, it's about the power of the NFL. And Elliot and his attorneys trying to match that and win against the NFL. That's what it's about. But nonetheless, moving forward, I really want to really know what's going on with before I get into this comparison in terms of uh, the Cowboys and the NFC and everything like that, I really want to know something. What is a blind side hit? A block, excuse me, block. What is a blind side block? I really want to know. I know what a blind side hit is. I know what a block is. I know what getting blind side is. What in the world is a blind side block? There was a penalty called against Dallas in the game against the Kansas City Chiefs this past Sunday for a blind side block. I'm confused. I just, was his back turned? Was he holding? Was he already on the ground? What, that, what, was it, what is a blind side block? I get it. NFL is trying to do everything that they can to protect the players because the injuries are so important to the game of football, and they're trying to minimize that to a T. As much as they can, I understand all of that. But I came from an era, and I'm using the word era, and I'm only 21 years old. That's how you know it's a problem. But I came from an era. When you strapped up, when you put those shoulder pads on, when you put that helmet on, when you lace those cleats up, and you step out on that grit iron, as we call it, and I'm pretty sure some people still call it today, but when you stepped out on that grit iron, it was either you or him, your job was to knock his head off. Why? Because he's going to knock your head off. And it's either you or him. And when I was playing football, calls like blindside block, I never got those calls. I've been blindsided plenty of times. Yes, I didn't see it coming. Yes, it hurts. Because any hit hurts when you don't anticipate it. But if I saw it coming... It probably wouldn't have hurt this bad. I probably would have had time to brace for it. But I didn't. So it did hurt. I get that. But how is that still a penalty, though? That's the game of football. Everybody is fair game, from my understanding. I know that there's rules in terms of uh, late hit because you do have to protect your quarterback and everything like that. I'm not talking about those particular calls. I'm talking about calls that they have now implemented, like blindside block, that's just honestly just, you know. Now, here's one thing. If, if, if the play is far downfield, I mean so far. And I remember that, I, I even remember there's one particular point in the game where even if the play was so far downfield, everybody is still fair game. If you're not on the sidelines, if you're within those hash marks, and you're one of the 11, the one, if you're one of the 22 guys on the field, particularly if you're one of the other 11 for the opposing team, if you're in field play, 
regardless of where the ball was, you were fair game. As long as you weren't holding, as long as you weren't blocking, as, as long as you weren't blocking his back, as long as you weren't uh yeah, you weren't getting caught with pass interference, you were fair game. That's the era that I grew up in. All these new calls that they've generated now to the NFL, I get on one hand, yes, you're trying to protect more, uh, if you're trying to protect the players more and everything like that. But some of them can just get canceled. Some of them can just get kind of costly, and it's starting to become a cancer. I mean, seriously, blindside block. But, but you know what? You know what? Nonetheless, nonetheless, I just don't agree with it. I totally don't. That one call out of all calls that I can possibly think of, I don't agree with that call. I really don't. Because where was that call at when I was playing? <laughs> That's all I got to say. But Cowboys improved to 5-3 and three on the season. Now, who had the most impressive win in terms of the Cowboys defeating the Kansas City Chiefs by a score of 28-17 to 17, or the Philadelphia Eagles running through the Denver Broncos by a score of 51-23? to 23. Who had the best? Who had, a, who had the most impressive win? I want to be clear about this question. The question is, who has the most impressive win? I got to go with the Cowboys. I really do. And it's not coming from a biased standpoint because I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan. I love the star. Yes, I do. You can't see it, but I'm wearing a Dallas Cowboys shirt right now. But I believe it's a Dallas Cowboys. From where the Cowboys started at the beginning of the season, having a rough, rough patch, everybody already counting them out after losing against the Rams, after losing against the Green Bay Packers, after losing crazily, after crazily losing against the Denver Broncos, everybody had the Cowboys ruled out for this season. They did. Eagles have been doing this from day one. I can't stand the Eagles. I really can't. I really can't stand Philadelphia fans. People I talk about Dallas Cowboy fans like, oh, we're just so bad. Have you ran into a Philadelphia Eagles fan? And if you haven't, I would say watch out. That's all I'm going to say about that. I've been to plenty of Dallas Cowboys and Philadelphia Eagles games. Oh, buddy. They're just as bad as us, if not worse. You get a little bit of look inside them. Woo-hoo! But nonetheless, back to the topic at hand. Honestly. I personally feel like Dallas Cowboys had a better, it was the most impressive win to me. But let's just be honest. The Kansas City Chiefs are a good football team. They really are. They've already beat teams like the New England Patriots and everything like that. Oh, great teams this year. They've already, they've already done that. They have. And what's most impressive to me was the defense. Offense, I'm not surprised with. The offense is going to put up 30-plus points a game. That's just what they do. They put up 28 last night, but the offense is known to put up at least 30. Got one of the best offense. Got one of the top five scoring offenses in the league. Us and Kansas City, to be exact. So, for us, for the defense, the spot on the team that was honestly frustrating for me, the defense, who has not been playing good up to this point, holding, the Kansas City Chiefs to 17. Oh, that says something. That really says something to me. Honestly, and it's really the fact that we were able to sustain Kareem Hunt, a guy who's leading the league in rushing yards. Let's be clear about that. He's leading them. He's leading the NFL. Tyreek Hill, for the most part, was able to sustain him. Minus a crazy big play at the end of the second quarter. That right there was just unbelievable. I mean, I can't – I got to give credit where credit was due. Andy Reid, that was an excellent, excellent draw up by the head coach for the Kansas City Chiefs. That was great. I got to give credit where credit was due. And a lot of people had a lot of controversy right up about that as far as uh, the prevent defense in terms of what it's meant for in terms of how they really weren't trying to give uh, – one trying to put most of the blame on the Cowboys for that run by Tariq Hill at the end of the second quarter. Let me tell you something. The prevent defense. I understand that, yes, it's mainly for Hail Marys, and it really was really uh, that prevent defense is really anticipating uh, Hail Marys to prevent everything like that. But nonetheless, in terms of the title, prevent defense, prevent defense, yes, on one hand, maybe it's supposed to give up the big play in terms of the yardage because you're so far back because you're guarding the end zone. 
You can make the argument that it, the prevent defense is meant to give up the big play because we don't care about that. All we care about is not letting you score. That's why we're playing so far back. The prevent defense is supposed to give up the big play, but the prevent defense is not supposed to allow you to score. That's it. That's what the prevent defense is designed for, to not give up the touchdown, whether that be through a Hail Mary, which is what most teams try to shoot for, at the end of the sec- at the end of a quarter when they got a few seconds left and they're trying to get a big score, or in particular a play like that was ran on Sunday by Kareem Hunt, the quick little pass got about three or four blockers in front of you, still not supposed to give up the touchdown. So I give credit where credit's due in that aspect of the game in terms of the Kansas City Chiefs, and that was it. By by it been an excellent excellent play drawn up by Andy Reid that was wonderful. But nonetheless, minus that, the fact that they were able to sustain Travis Kelsey, one of uh, uh, Alex Smith's go-to guy, yes. I mean, I, Tyreek Hill, I understand that. He's great. He's excellent on the outside. But Travis Kelsey is Alex Smith's go-to man, especially on third downs, third and five, third and six, third and seven. Travis Kelsey, that's who you can look for. And Jeff, he, my goodness, I thought he was dead. The fact that he he finally got an interception. I had to blink a few times because is that Jeff Heath breaking on a ball? I have never seen him do anything like it. So far, I've been seeing the back of number 38 this entire season. But that's what we used to say with Jeff Heath. Let's just be clear. I made the same argument about Morris Claiborne when he was playing cornerback for the Dallas Cowboys. I said, I said, what does Morris Claiborne, what does the front of his jersey look like? Can somebody tell me? Because we're always looking at the back of his jersey. And I made the same argument for Jeff Heath. He's always trying to catch up to somebody. He's always trying to run down the ball. This is the first time that he's been on the team since last year that I finally saw him break on a ball. Only took him to the second half, but my goodness, the fact that you realize, Jeff Heath, that you're in a very neutral position. Travis Kelsey is the go-to man for Alex Smith. Who is he really going to look for on third and five, third and six, especially if it's a manageable third and five and 36? Oh, it's that big number 87, Travis Kelsey. He's going to run that pitch route. He's going to run a little drag route. Break on the ball. Be a defensive back. We don't just put you there to make tackles. I can go get anybody out there that can make tackles after the catch. That's not hard. We put you there to break on balls, anticipate the ball, be explosive. And finally, he did that. The only question I have is, can you keep this up? Because we're going to need more of this with you, especially when we face Philadelphia, because we got to play them not once, but twice this year. And I need to see more of that. But honestly, seriously, in terms of more impressive, really? You know, definitely supposed to do that to the Broncos. Yes, and I get that. This is the same Broncos team that just ran right through Dallas in the beginning of the season. Yes, I watched that game from start to finish. There's no argument there. They did. I mean, you can, I, can also, I can't make the argument that we didn't have Sean Lee, who is the heart and soul of this defense, and we've seen improvements ever since Sean Lee has been back. You know, it's only, you know it only been against uh, San Francisco, but then we all saw it against a very explosive team on offense that is the Kansas City Chiefs, holding them by 17 points, holding Kareem Hunt, not even 50 yards rushing, holding Tyreek Hill, holding Travis Kelsey, believe it or not, for like 70 yards, uh, 70 reception yards. That's good in terms of productivity of your defense when you're facing against Kansas City Chiefs and that offense. It is. So, with all that being said, I I believe that this was the most that this was a more impressive win by the Dallas Cowboys because that forty two seventeen that forty two seventeen victory that the Broncos had against Dallas in the early part of the season look that was their Super Bowl it really was they were two and zero at the time I believe Dallas was one and one that was the Broncos Super Bowl yay congratulations. Let the balloons fall down. Let the confetti fly. That was the Denver Broncos Super Bowl because where in the hell have they been up to this point? The fact that you got a bridge Trevor Simeon for Brock Osweiler who really showed you that, hey, I wasn't nothing when I was here. 
I left, I went to Houston, I wasn't nothing, and now I'm back here, and as you can see, nothing has changed. whoop de doo okay? So nonetheless, the Philadelphia Eagles were supposed to do that, okay? They were supposed to. In terms of this victory that the Dallas Cowboys had against the Kansas City Chiefs, it was a much-needed win. It was an explosive win. It was a statement for the NFC East and Philadelphia Eagles. Yes, I said it. It was a statement by the Dallas Cowboys to the 9-1 Eagles. It really was. Yes, a team that has only lost one game. Oh, and by the way, who was that one loss? By the Philadelphia Eagles? Who did they lose to? Oh, oh, yeah, oh, oh, you're right. The Kansas City Chiefs. Who beat the Kansas City Chiefs this Sunday? None other than the star, the Dallas Cowboys. That's who. That's why it was a more impressive win. I can tell you, it wasn't impressive. The Giants getting destroyed 51-17. to Giants shouldn't be allowed to play football. He should. This is just hang it up. Hang up the season. I go to Sun. If you're listening, yes, I said it. Hang up the season. It's okay. It's, it's okay. You still got Porzingis and the New York Knicks doing some noise. I mean, you fell out in baseball. The New York Yankees couldn't get it done. And they allowed the Houston Astros not only advance to the World Series, but win. They couldn't get it done. So I'm sorry. Just hang up the season. Jared Goff went off. It was 14 for 22 for 311 yards and four touchdowns. I'm going to be honest with you. I personally feel like we're starting to see why Jerry Goff was the number one overall pick in the 2016 NFL draft. We're starting to see that. I said this uh, I, I said this last time. For the last two times I, went, I did this show, everybody thought Jerry Goff was a bust last year because of the way that he played. But I still credit a lot of Excuse me. I still credit a lot of that to Jeff Fisher, who was just destroying the L.A. Rams in that program. He really was. Jeff Fisher had to go. We saw how Jared Goff played under his direction. We saw how Ty Gurley played under his leadership. Jeff Fisher's out. Now, Jared Goff is playing at the number one overall pick that he was in the 2016 NFL draft. I mean, the numbers are there. And this isn't, this isn't me. I'm not an advocate for the L.A. Rams and Jared Goff and all this concerns. But the facts are the facts. And the dude is balling out, honestly. I'm not going to rule out. Everybody, everybody said they want to see the L.A. Rams and the Eagles play each other in terms of the NFC. It's concerned. I get that. Because on paper, you can say, and if you've been watching the game week to week, you can say, and you can, you can argue in terms of the way the L.A. Rams have been playing and the way that the Philadelphia Eagles have been playing week to week to week in terms of how the competition will be if these two teams play. You can make the argument that as of now, these are the top two teams that have been playing consistently well every single week. Therefore, these are the two teams that should be playing each other. I get that. But I'm not ruling out Carolina. I'm not ruling out. I mean, even though, even though they lost to the Redskins, they did. I'm not ruling out the Seahawks. And I'm certainly not ruling out my Cowboys. I'm just not going to do it. Because Carolina is that team that when they win, they win. And you can feel the victory. But at the same time, it's like when they lose, it's one of those scratch your head losses. Like when, like when they when they lost when they lost to the Chicago Bears seventeen to three, it was a scratch your head loss. Like what? Were, were y'all sick? Were y'all did did, did, did did y'all show with a stomach virus? What what happened? Did you not show up? What, what you know? It's like you're talking to a kid. You, you didn't, you're not feeling it today. Is it, is it, what happened? It's like one of those losses. And then even when the Seahawks. I mean, it's, it's, it's the same thing, you know. I mean, you put on a show against the Texans, winning by a score of forty-one to thirty-eight. That was a show. It really was. Like I said before, I give credit where credit is due. It was great. But then you turn around the following week, 
then you lose to the Redskins, seventeen to fourteen. This, I, I, this secondary, this, this this Seahawks secondary is really frustrating. Earl, Earl Thomas still battling the hamstring injury. Cam Chancellor, I, I ain't really showing up being that big leader in the secondary like I need him to be. I, I really, I really just don't know. I, I, I really just don't know. But at the same time, I still say, I rule now the Carolina Panthers. I rule now the Seattle Seahawks. And I rule now the Dallas Cowboys. As of this week, like I said before, I still need to see more from that secondary of the Seahawks. Eric Thomas, it's time to go to work. Cam Chancellor, let's go. Richard Sherman, let's go. This is a secondary that we expect you all to be. Step up and be leaders for the rest of those guys and play like we know y'all can play. As the show is getting ready to come to an end, got a few more things to touch on. If you just now tuned in, we've covered college football, Ohio State, the top four for the playoffs as far as FBS is concerned. The shootout between Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, Baker Mayfield going off for nearly 600 yards, passing five touchdowns. Preview football, Thursday night football in terms of the NFL, Cowboys, Giants, NFC, all of that. We discuss all of that here on the Outspoken Podcast. We the airways of OBN Radio, and it's all with the second floor of the Memorial Student Center, better known as the MSC. There's one team I just have to get off my chest. I really do. And that's the Houston Texans. I don't know what I don't know what the deal is. What I what I mean by that is, no, is it your fault that Deshaun Watson tore his ACL in practice, even though it wasn't off of contact? Is it your fault? Absolutely, positively not. But it still doesn't mean you have to settle. It does. That does not mean you have to settle. Tom Savage, T.J. Yates, Matt McGloin. Matt Scott, like, you don't have to settle. You don't. Texas losing the AFC South of Columbus, Indianapolis, coached by score of 20 to 14. I'm more frustrated that because I'm here in Prairie View and because I only get one 12 o'clock game, I had to suffer through the Houston, Texas, and the Indianapolis coach until 325 when I was able to finally watch my Dallas Cowboys just run through the Kansas City Chiefs and winning with a statement. I was, I was more sure I have to suffer through that, but nonetheless, I had to. So therefore, I figured, you know what, if I'm going to suffer through it, if I'm going to be subjected to watching this, I might as well analyze it to the best of my ability. And I truly did. I truly analyzed it to the best of my ability. And what it comes down to is two words and damage that time damage. That's what it comes down to. There's no other way I can really put this. I can't shake this up into any uh, spectacular way or anything like that for the Houston Texans. No. You got to get rid of Tom Savage. I don't know why the hell you went out and got T.J. Yates and Matt McGoin like that, which is going to make a bit of damn difference. Hell, at that point, you might as well keep Tom Savage, and at least he's had some experience this year and the previous years, and it won't be as worse. You might as well keep him in if you're going to go out and get those guys. There have been talks in the front office about possibly signing Kaepernick to a deal, but at the same time, they're not going to go through with it because they feel like it's a collision between Colin Kaepernick and the NFL. Let me make this very clear. No, Bill O'Brien and those guys are scared to take a chance on Colin Kaepernick. That's no secret, but make no mistake about it. He don't want Tom Savage at either. He really don't. There's no way in hell you coach that game on Sunday against the Indianapolis Colts because, in my opinion, with or without Deshaun Watson, Houston Texans should still be the Indianapolis Colts. That's how bad the Colts have been have been this year. They're not at the bottom of the AFC South and damn near the bottom of the AFC for nothing, okay? Let's be perfectly clear about that. You're the Houston Texans. You're supposed to be the Indianapolis Colts with or without Deshaun Watson. Now, I understand that yeah, that he's been an excellent player and he's been great for y'all, even though it's not like ever since Deshaun Watson was there, y'all been winning up to this point, but he has breathed some life into y'all team, not just your offense, but your entire program. But, damn, you mean to tell me you're that damn bad without him? I just don't agree with it. I just don't. 
But in terms of Tom Savage, he has to go. Now, I understand you're scared to take a chance and everything like that, but what else are you going to do? At this point, what do you have to lose? If you bring Colin Kaepernick and he's a bust and he's not what all of us, including myself, says he can be for your organization, at that point, at least you can make the argument, damn it, I tried. I cared enough about this organization. I cared enough about winning in this organization that I was willing to do whatever it took to bring the best guy in that I personally felt was good enough for the job, and it just didn't get done. I have zero problems with that. You would hear no arguments from me. Yes, I understand you have those people in the world that say one thing, but when one thing happens and it doesn't work out, they say another. What I mean by this, yes, you're going to have people that's going to be all in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to get Colin Kaepernick. He's good for your organization. He's good for your organization. Colin Kaepernick goes out there and he just thinks up with him because he hasn't played since last year. Uh, why are y'all, why they signed Colin Kaepernick? I don't know why they did that. He didn't play since last year. There's no reason why they, why they should have signed him. They should have kept going with other players that's been playing. Yes. You're going to have people like that. But so damn what? So what? They don't know. They don't know just like you don't know. They're speculating just like me and everybody else are speculating what he could do based on what he's done in the past. Because, honestly, the past is all we can go off. That's all we can go off. That's it. We can't go off anything else. If we would, if we could, we would. But we can't. So, yes, I am another one that's just going off the past because, unfortunately, that's all I have to go off of. That's all I have to dissect. And what I'm saying is, regardless of what people will say if it don't work out, I'm okay with the statement, damn it, we tried. What else were we going to do? Settle for Tom Savage? Settle for Matt McGloin? Settle for TJ Gates? Oh, and by the way, for everyone out there that's saying that, oh, why would they go with Colin Kaepernick? He ain't played since last year. At the end of the day, all they do is go out and get players who haven't played for years. So what does that mean? That doesn't mean a damn thing, okay? You, yes, yeah, that's what you do. You stay sign players that hasn't played. Teams have done that before, and they continue to do that to this day. So that right there doesn't matter in itself. At the end of the day, I'd rather go with the guy who has made it to the postseason, who has made it to the Super Bowl, who has showed that he can play and still score touchdowns without having a wide receiver core. Because the last time he played in San Francisco, his touchdown to interception ratio was four to one. And that's what having that's what not having anybody to throw to. So give me that guy over some mediocrity or below mediocrity. That's where I am with that. But nonetheless. My whole deal is with them at this point, what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose? We are near to the end of this show, but I still have two more points I want to quickly touch on. Honestly, this right here, this right here made me laugh. And I said I was going to say this for the last of the show because I just had to. And that's, that, that's just the, the fight that happened this past weekend. I mean, you got you got Jalen Ramsey, you got A.J. Green, you got, you got Mike Evans just throwing, throwing in his two cents, hoping for one cent back uh, against Marshawn Lattimore. And you, you, you got uh, just – Jameis Winston pointing a finger and everything like that, which I don't know why the hell he's doing that because karma is you know what. Because I, I, that, from what I saw, he ended up with a shoulder injury. He had a shoulder, he had a shoulder injury prior to before, but it was good enough in the play. It was a week by week thing. But on top of that, you're causing all this commotion. You, you're being immature on the sideline, uh, pointing a finger uh, uh, to Marshawn Lattimore and in the back of his helmet. Then on top of that, you, you left the game with a shoulder injury. Now, what, are, what good are you to your organization? But I'm going to get to him in just a second. But I want to start with Jalen Ramsey and A.J. Green. My goodness. <laughs> from a, <laughs> I, I got to be clear when I say this. From a fan standpoint, when I watched the game, is it just me or I wasn't, I wasn't too quick to turn my channel when I, when I saw it? And I understand. I understand that. I understand Jalen Smith. He, he, he is with the push. I right, get all that. But – the retaliation. That reminds you when you were a kid and you was always told not to hit first. But the minute they put your hands on you, you go to work. And that's what A.J. Green did. Off of one little push, you would think he shot him in the kneecaps. The way he retaliated. That's how brutal this retaliation was. I mean, the choco, really, really, the choco. That, that's, uh, he, he, I don't know. He uses some more Joe's Kikina clutch on Jalen. That, that's really what that was. I mean, the retaliation was, was something brutal. 
at the end of the day. What I really want to know is why the hell Jalen why the hell Jalen Ramsey got got ejected. There's no question why AJ Green got ejected. They must have been exchanging words back and forth for the entire game. But why did Jalen Ramsey get ejected? I mean, if you go back and watch that game or watch that fight, what did he get ejected for? For getting beat up? I don't understand the other reason why he got ejected. I really want to know. What did he really do that would cause him to get ejected? But nonetheless, from a viewer standpoint, wow, unbelievable. But at the same time, it's not cool. It's not cool. What I saw this weekend, it was, it was that, I, 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 don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. Mike Evans started an altercation. Well, he really started with Jameis Winston, but Mike Evans did not have to go intervene and, and do what he did. That was just over the top. And it started with Jameis Winston being immature and petty on the sideline, uh, pointing the finger in the back of Marshawn Lattimore's helmet. Then Marshawn Lattimore pushed Jameis Winston. Then Mike Evans just came out of nowhere. That right there was a blind side for you. You talk about blind side. That was crazy. That 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 was mad crazy right there. You and I, and I it just came in today because it took him a minute to finally come in because this morning I'm like, Mike Mike Evans should get it. He should get fined. And he should get suspended for that. You you can't do that and think you just don't get away with it. That's completely unacceptable. Completely unacceptable. And it came in the day that Mike Evans will be suspended for one game uh, for the altercation that he caused uh, this past Sunday. But I want to jump into James Winston because the Saints end up being Tampa Bay thirty to ten. Tampa Bay Buccaneers are two and six this year. Two and six. Amos Winston, you are the leader of this organization. You are. You're the quarterback. It starts with you. You haven't been playing well all season. It's been inconsistent play. I know the offense. I know the offense lines a little suspect. If you haven't been playing that well yourself this season, you are in no shape to do what you did. Why would you do that? Why would you take a chance? You know how petty these refs can be. You do the smallest thing and get you kicked out. Why would you take a chance? You and Mike Evans both. Why would you take a chance on getting kicked out of the game and not being there for your team? Because who in the hell is this offense without you two? The offense isn't so great with you, but they're piss poor without you. That's just, that's just being completely real with that. Who is an offense without you? So why would you take a chance to do anything that could jeopardize the both of you possibly not being there for the duration of this game? And we see here, Mike Evans, they're not going to have you for one week. You're already two and six. The last thing that they need is for you not being there on the on the offense and contributing to the offensive scoring and everything like that's concerned. Then on top of that, James Winston, then you got hurt. I'm not saying that I'm an advocate for players getting hurt and everything like that, but karma is a you-know-what. And when it comes, it comes strong. You can't do certain things to certain people and treat people a certain way and think that you're going to get away with it because you're not. And as we see here, really, you went out with a shoulder injury. And then it's uncertain if you're, going to, if you're going to be playing this upcoming week. Wow. Good job. Good job. As we come to an end, as I mentioned before, the last thing I want to get into now, I'm gonna try to be very quick about this, but I'm just gonna be honest. I don't know how I don't know how quick I can be because I've been trying to get this off my shoulder for the past two weeks, and I've always been going over time for a little bit, and I've been holding it back. I've been saving it and saving it and saving it and saving it, which is, I say, you know what? I gotta get this off my chest so I can move on because it's been on this paper. I've 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 been given several topics all week, and it's been on this paper for the past two weeks, and I have not spoken about it, but I have to. As you all know, I'm a Dallas fan. I'm a Dallas fan, period. I'm a Cowboys fan. I'm a Mavericks fan. I ain't really a Stars fan because I don't really, I mean, you can, yeah, I, I would guess so I'm a Stars fan, but I don't watch hockey. And I was a Rangers fan per se, but now I have jumped the bandwagon. I'm now used to Astros fan. Yes, I said it. I said it last week, and I'm saying it again here today on Outspoken. I am a Houston Astros fan. You will see me in Houston paraphernalia. You will not see me in Houston Rockets gear, nor will you see me in Houston, Texas gear. There's no way I can go back to Dallas with that filth on. My people will never forgive me. But nonetheless, the Dallas Mavericks 
are infuriating. I don't even know if he raises the word, but I, I'm trying to be civil when I talk about this because there's some other choice words that I could say, but I'm not going to say it. They start, they start the season off one and two. Just like the Giants, maybe they should cancel this damn season. Mark Cuban has no business firing back at anyone. For those of you that were keeping up with the news, there's a little controversy between Mark Cuban and Draymond Green because Draymond Green put out a statement in terms of how – is how the owners, like their title should not be called owners. It should be called chairman because owners can take a totally different turn in terms of owning people and everything like that because ultimately the players do work for the owners. That's just how it is. That's just how it's set up. But Draymond Green felt that it shouldn't be that they shouldn't be named owners, that they should be named chairman. Mark Cuban, of course, he is the owner of the Dallas Mavericks, and he took offense to that, and he fired back at Draymond Green. Nonetheless, not saying that Mark Cuban did not have a strong point. I'm not saying that. But your team is running 10 right now. You're firing back at the guy who has been to back to back, back to back, back to back NBA finals. Has won two out of the three. That's who you're firing back at. You ain't been to the NBA finals since 2010. Just seven seasons ago. And you have the nerve, the audacity. To fire back at Draymond Green, you need to be turned around and paid more attention to your own damn organization. Yes, I said it. Because you wanna know what? You've been lying to Dirk Nowitz- to Dirk Nowitzki for damn near five seasons now. You've been telling Dirk that you're gonna bring in some some players. You're gonna bring in some guys that can play. You're gonna build. I'm gonna build around you. But in order for me to do that. I need you to take a pay cut. Dirk done took more damn pay cuts than any player I've ever met in my entire life. Really. He took a smaller three-year deal for $25 million when he was originally up for the max deal. I believe that was in, what, 2014. He turned down offers from Houston and the Lakers for that same max contract to stay in Dallas. I want to just go down the list. I just want to go down the list. And by the way, they signed Chandler Parsons to that $45 million contract, which means that same type of deal that Dirk would have been up for and more, which means he'll be making eight, he'll be making eight more annually than the face of the franchise. That's what they did. And even before that, Dirk signed a four-year $80 million deal when he was originally up for the $96 million deal to bring in more talent to help out. But in terms of the talent he was supposed to bring in, I just want to run down the list real quick. And I ain't, and this is not even the whole list. But because we're about to work, because we're over time, I just want to quickly run down this list. Because this, this is really makes me laugh. You brought in Chandler Parsons, Raymond Felton, Rajah Rondo, who hasn't been the same since he was in Boston and he was a part of the big three with Paul Pierce, Ray Allen with a big four in terms of him Ray Allen, Paul Pierce, and Kevin Garnett. He hasn't been the same since. But you brought in Chandler Parsons, Raymond Felton, Raja Rondo, Charlie Villanova, Amar Salamar, who, one, I will possibly circle, even when he was here, the level of productivity wasn't that good because he could never stay healthy. So he wasn't the same since he left Phoenix. But nonetheless, you brought in Amari Sotomayor. They raised an eyebrow, but the eyebrow went back down quickly because he, his productivity here was, was trash. Darren Williams, another one, who honestly, actually, for a minute, was contemplating as to whether or not he wanted to come. And it sounded like to me, it seemed like to me at first he didn't want to be here because it took him a minute for us to finally get him here, even though he's from Dallas. He acted like he didn't want to be here in the first damn place, and we saw it, by the way, he played on the court. I made an argument for him ahead when he was, he was even in Cleveland. He was just, just sorry. He was trash. Darren Williams played like that old guy that's, that's in the court, that old guy that comes to the gym that you call school. Hey, what's up, school? What's up? How you doing? You know, you know, the guy that got to got to wrap his knees up or got to put the icing hot on before you step out on the court. That's how Darren Williams played. Then you go out and get Harrison Barnes. 
Now you think you're do, now you think you're doing something by getting a guy who just came from a championship team that is the Golden State Warriors. So you think you're doing something by going out against Harrison Barnes and thinking he can just be that elite player for you. And yes, when he got here last year, he was averaging 20 plus points a game. But for somehow, for some reason, it was inconsistent for a night, and he it still felt like he wasn't doing enough. But nonetheless, you go out and you get Harrison Barnes. Then you get Wesley Matthews, who can't play a lick of damn defense to save his life. Then you go out and get one half for the Curry brothers. Would have been nice to get Seth, I mean, to get uh, Steph, but to get Seth Curry. Okay, I can understand that. Seth Curry proved himself. Came from the D League, proved that he belongs in the NBA. Still has a lot of improvements to come. Of course, he's not his brother Steph Curry. We get all that. But to his argument, Steph has also been in the league more than him has also had more time to improve before him. I do personally believe that everything comes with improvement, especially when it comes to Steph Curry, if I feel like it's within you. But you go out and you get Steph Curry. You go out and get Nerland Noel. Now, this, now, this is another one for me. That, that's, it's, and you get to one team, it's like, okay, yeah, when he was in Philadelphia, all right, yes. Once, but once Tyson Chandler left, the big man was much needed. For Dallas, because Tyson Chandler, uh, while he was not, you know, very effective, he was not very productive on the offensive side of the floor. He definitely brought that defense and that toughness to your team. So you try replacing with Nerland wow. Noel has nearly not worked to perfection. Then you get Yogi Ferrell, <laughs> really, and then the last, the only one that I'm an advocate for to a T on this entire list. And that's Dennis Smith Jr. Dennis Smith Jr. He is the only one that I am a true advocate for on this entire list. I really am. I can't I, I don't know who else I can really be an advocate for. He was ranked amongst the top point guards in the class of the, two, of the 2016 NBA draft class, and he is still my pick for the rookie of the year. He really is. He's my pick. Now, yeah, you got Lonzo Ball, you got De'Aaron Fox, you got all these other guys, and even though Lonzo Ball certainly isn't my pick because the way he's playing in L.A. right now, but that's neither here nor there. But that's another su- subject for another day. But Dennis Smith Jr. is still my pick for the rookie of the year. But in terms of this list, and guess what, guys? Guess what, ladies and gentlemen? This isn't even the full list. This is just a taste of what they went out and got since their 2010 championship season. Not nearly as half of the ball players that they had when they won the championship. And this is who they replaced those guys with. And you can see how well they've been performing, right? You can see that. And you can credit a lot of that to this year. This is the worst start in franchise history. It's just piss poor. It's just it's frustrating me. It really is. Why do Dallas teams have to be the laughing stock of the league? Whether it's the Cowboys, who I'm still an advocate for because at least they play like they deserve to be there. I mean, the damn Mavericks play like that. Like, like they're a damn D-League team, and they're not. But starting the season off 1-10, 1-10 is highly unacceptable. Highly unacceptable. Mark Cuban stayed off of Twitter. Get it together or shut up, get your team together, or just hang up the season. And stop wasting everybody's time, because that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. And we're out of time here, ladies and gentlemen, on Outspoken. I want to thank you all so much for joining us. One thing, my main man, Dr. Mike Prince, for giving me this opportunity, as I am coming to you live from the second floor of the Memorial Student Center, better known as the MSC. We'll be back on again Thursday, 730. PM. Hope you all set your clock back last uh, last night to an hour because we got an extra hour and it was much needed. All right, I get a little body here, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so much for joining us, for joining me. I am your host, Andre Davis, and you have been listening to the latest and the greatest of the Outspoken Podcast through the airways of OBN Radio. And I will see you next time.